about the Rome. Uh, and a Rom is very interesting in the Arabic language uh, because it relates to really the Europeans. It's sometimes translated as the Byzantines. But before I do that, I actually wanted to discuss a little bit the image that was on the, the podcast advertisement, which was a, so some people wondered what the image represented or uh, why a Native American. And there were a few different reasons that I had for putting that image there, or choosing it rather. One of them was that we were discussing nations and tribes, and it was a reminder that there are still tribal people in the United States, the Native American peoples. A lot of people literally forget about them. In fact, it's interesting, there's a lot of focus on other minorities, but the indigenous peoples of this country still exist, and they actually exist as sovereign nations. A lot of people don't know that also, that the what are called reservations, are actually the remnants of their native lands that they had in this country. And the reason that, that I chose that image is because the, the podcast was discussing the content of character. And one of the things that you note about people is that character can actually be seen in the faces of people. So when you, when you meet somebody who is a, an upright person of good character, you often see that reflected in their faces. The Muslims very often say things like, he has a lot of light in his face, or she has a lot of light in her face. What they're really saying is there's a type of purity, what the Arabs call ma'al waj, which is the, the water of the face. I mean, we talk about in, in, in the West things like saving face or losing face. So this is very much at the heart of it, that one of the Arabic words for face is sahifa which actually means that your sahaf are what you bring on the Day of Judgment. So your face is really also the book of your actions. And uh, a very famous American homeopath, James Tyler Kent, said that by 50, everybody has the face that they deserve. So you've lived long enough. And you can see this in people's faces, the dissipated faces. People can be very beautiful when they're young, but then you see them when they get old and they're very ugly. And that's from a bad life. Other people you see who might not have been attractive when they were young, but they're actually very beautiful when they're old, and that's from living a good life. So you can actually see the good life of a person on his face. So I felt that that picture really reflected the character of whoever that man was. He was letting us know who he was in that picture, just with that face that he had. And the thing about uh, traditional peoples or aboriginal peoples is that even though they're not our, our religion highly regards literacy and highly regards the accomplishments that go with civilizations. We have always, as a, uh, as a faith, have recognized the right of traditional peoples to live. It's one of the hallmarks of Islam is that wherever it went, it never eliminated uh, the orang asli, the Malays call them, you know, the original people. Orang asli are the, the, the original people. These are what Bedu is from the, the people that first appeared, the Bedouin, because this is where we come from. And the fact that Allah has maintained these people on the planet is very interesting because they're everywhere. And we forget about them. We forget about a lot of the extraordinary things that they have. They're, and I'm not romantic about this because there's a lot of negative aspects to people in, in a state of nature. Uh, the in-group, out-group problem, pseudo-speciation is a, is a big word for that. So I'm not romantic about it, but I also know that there really are some extraordinary Native American people that, that embody these qualities. And one of them, I had the, the great benefit of coming to know, is Chief Arvel Looking Horse. Chief Arvel and I came to know each other at uh, Davos because we were both part of the C-100 which was a group of religious leaders that were brought in after 9-11. And Chief Arvel, the way we first met was we were in a gathering of all these leaders, and the head of it was the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, who at the time was Lord Carey. And uh, I suggested to the group that we actually do a survey of the people at Davos that could be anonymous, that we, but we find out like what they believed, because these are some of the most powerful people in the world. And I, I would be interested to know, did they believe in God? What type of ethical framework they were working from? Because these are the heads of major corporations and uh, the movers and shakers on the planet. And Lord Carey said that, uh, you know, this was the first year that they had invited us and that, you know, we really don't want to ruffle feathers. 
And he literally used that term, ruffle feathers. Well, immediately, the other end of the room, it was a large room because we were probably about close to 100 people, religious leaders from all over the world. Chief Arvel raised his hand, and he's a very noble-looking person. He, he's got one of those faces that you can tell. He just comes from a, a lineage of just noble. He's from Lakota people, which are the, they're also called Sioux. And anyway, he, uh, he raised his hand, and he said, my name's Chief Arvel Looking Horse. I'm the, the pipe carrier of the Lakota Nation, which is a, is a huge honor in the Lakota Nation is to carry the pipe. He said, I'm a pipe carrier in the Lakota Nation. <laughs> and in our tradition, a spiritual leader is only there to ruffle feathers. And if he's not willing to ruffle feathers, he needs to step aside and let somebody else <laughs> take that position. So at that point, his wife raised her hand, and then Lord Carey acknowledged her, and she said, I'm the wife of the pipe carrier of the Lakota people, and I agree with what my husband <laughs> said, which is also something from that tradition where they, apparently the Iroquois, um, when they did their council, the women stood behind the men, and if they agreed with what they said, they would, they would like pat them, and if they didn't, they would kick them. So th that was a very interesting moment. So we actually hit it off after that. And a few years later, probably about four or five years later, I was actually in Louisville at an event, and Chief Arville was there, and we stayed at the same house. So he and I were having breakfast one morning, and I said to him, I don't know if I ever told you this, but uh, my great-grandfather, Archibald Chisholm, he was an um, immigrant from Scotland, but he was a very successful miner and actually owned a large portion of the Wasabi Range in Minnesota. Now, Minnesota is actually a Lakota word, Minnesota, which means misty early morning waters, because there's a lot of lakes in Minnesota. So I told him, you know, my great-grandfather strip-mined a lot of the Wasabi Range, and there's actually a town named after him, Chisholm, Minnesota. And, uh, and I said, could you find in your heart, like, just to forgive my family? So at that moment, he like turned away, and I thought, this was a mistake, <laughs> because I just, you know, uh, we had really gotten along well before, up to that point, and I thought, okay, this was a mistake. So we didn't, he didn't say anything to me the rest of the morning. We, we just had breakfast in silence. It was very uncomfortable. So the next day, we were on a panel together. And he said, uh, we were asked to, to say something we had benefited from another faith tradition outside of our own. And we were sitting next to each other. And he said that Christianity was the only faith tradition that he knew, and he didn't really have anything <laughs> good to say about it because they had taken away uh, his people's traditions and force theirs on his people. So that was his what, what he said. But he said, I will say that as, as the pipe carrier of the Lakota Nation, I am not permitted to have rancor in my heart. And then he said, so I just want to let my brother, Hamza, and then he, he said a word in Lakota, which he said meant a friend. And then he said that, I have no rancor. In my heart for his family. And so after that, it was, it was really strange because people came up to me and they were just saying, because none of them knew the context of it. So they were saying, what was that about? That, that was, that was, we all felt it. It was so powerful, that moment. So I think what, what was really powerful about it was it was just a moment of forgiveness. You know, and that's part of what the thing of we made you in peoples and tribes you know, to, to know one another. So, 
he knew me and I knew him. And that's, that's where it gets down to that most basic level, you know, at the individual level. Because so many of our problems are directly a result of collectivizing, of just looking at people as groups and not as individuals. And so that's the whole essence of this idea of judging people by the content of their character. 